faith is never enough. And you came along and you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. And here is your love. Because there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Good morning, church. Please stand as we worship the Lord. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. My fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come true because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the light
of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night 
my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Yet not I, Lord God, but through Christ in us. Lord, we thank you and we glorify you for all that we're able to do through you and, and for you, Lord God. We ask that your Holy Spirit will lead us and direct us in this service, Lord God. We pray that as we unify, Lord God, that our praises go up, Lord God, that it will be sweet and sis before your throne. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, welcome, everyone. It's uh, so good to see you again. Uh, welcome to Pursuit Church. Well, last week, uh, somebody reminded me that I had forgotten to ask the essential question. And the essential question, of course, is what day is it? It's the best day of the week. It's the best day of the week for us to be together and uh, just to focus and to worship the Lord this morning. Well, I'd like to... Uh, Welcome back, a visitor that we have, and that's Serena. So, so it's uh, nice to see you. I know she's traveled down for a special occasion, um, and uh, so it's good to see you. Well, we have another visitor today, and that's my son, Brett. Um, so you might have noticed that we're dressed the same, um, but we really don't resemble each other very much. The reason is because I have shoes on. <laughs> And, uh, well, Brett is uh, sporting a really nice mustache, too. So, um, well, we're glad to have Brett here, and uh, he's here to just to be with us and uh, to help me with some things over the next couple of weeks. So, um, 
Well, um, we are Pursuit Church. We are pursuing belonging, believing, and becoming in all the different uh, manifestations of that in the life of our church. Uh, we want for people to find a place of, of belonging. Um, we, want, we want them, of course, to be strengthened in their believing and, and most of all, in their becoming more like God's children um, in all the different dimensions of that. Um, so we've, uh, last few weeks, we've been um, going through uh, what's called the 1689 London Baptist uh, Confession of Faith. And uh, first, we've gone through, uh, we read through some of the, the first chapter, which was on the Word of God, and now, now I would like to read something from the second chapter, which is uh, of God and the Holy Trinity. And so it's good for us just to hear these confessions that have been really well articulated and thought through and hammered through actually over centuries of, of doctrine. And so let's, uh, let's listen to this together. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who hath only immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable, means he's unchanging, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, in every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will. For his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and will who will by no means clear the guilty. So we we read about God in His person, in His Trinity, and uh, we are we are grateful for these words of teaching for us. This morning we are it's been the first. Sunday of the month, we are going to celebrate communion together. And so I invite the, uh, the deacons to distribute the elements to us, and we'll, we'll just pause for a moment as they do that. Jesus called his uh, followers to celebrate communion with him regularly. And what that means to us is that we, we take some time to celebrate what Jesus did for us and 
to celebrate our union with Christ, the fact that we as believers are in Christ. That's where God has placed us because of Jesus' work for us. Jesus' uh, crucifixion and death on the cross, of course, is an example to us, but it's so much more than that. It's, it was him doing what only he could do, and that's to bear the penalty for our sin. And so we gratefully partake of God's grace that he's given to us in, in the death of Jesus, his son. So in the next few weeks, we'll be finishing out the book of Matthew by the end of May. Um, we'll, we'll go through these chapters today, which are the last of his teaching. Then we'll look at his trial and his crucifixion. And finally, the Great Commission um, in the next uh, few weeks ahead. But we, uh, we're grateful for all that the Lord has done for us, and we partake this together. So in your cup, there's actually two cups. On the bottom is the bread, which we will partake of first. So the Apostle Paul told us, um, he was telling the Corinthian people what he had received from the Lord. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. Let's take the bread together. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's take the bread and eat it together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to this earth and teaching us all that you taught but also, Lord, doing what only you could do, and that was to be our sacrificial lamb, to die for us, for offering your body for us. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. And Paul continues, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so let's proclaim the Lord's death together by drinking this. Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your, your blood for us, for being our sacrificial lamb, pure and holy in every way, you fulfilled all, all of God's laws. You were perfect, and you died for us, and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. On Sundays where we celebrate communion together, we actually take two offerings, and uh, one is a benevolence offering, and another is um, just our general offering as well. And so um, if you'd like to give to benevolence and don't have a an envelope or way to keep it separate, just raise your hand and somebody can get you an envelope. Um, but let's, uh, let's take those offerings now together. Father, we thank you for this day that we can be together to worship and just enjoy one another, enjoy fellowship with you, being in your presence. Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to give to those that, that have needs within our own body and also those are, that are without, Lord. Give us wisdom always in knowing how to, uh, to share those funds with others. We thank you for this opportunity and just for you, the opportunity to give to your church and to your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And Lord, we also pray for Roy, uh, who spent a little time in the hospital yesterday, and um, I guess they're still working on what might be going on, but Lord, we pray that your hand of healing and, and strength would be upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. You unravel me with a 
melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name i've been born again unto your family your blood flows through my veins i'm no longer a slave to fear child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Ooh, oh, oh, be seated and the kids may go sit back. Well, speaking of children, um, when you're a parent of small kids, you often find yourself chasing them around, uh, making sure they don't hurt themselves. Am I right? Um, sometimes Janine would, when we were raising our boys and they were young, Janine would warn me, the boys, about something, and I might be relatively unconcerned about it. On the other hand, um, my alarm bells could go off, and uh, hers were quiet. And that, the reason for that is because I can remember getting hurt doing exactly what the boys were doing at that moment. Um, so we warn our kids when, uh, when they're climbing upstairs or trying to get out of the grocery cart. Uh, we warn them when they're around a hot stove. We put corner guards on furniture because we can imagine what might happen. Um, there are locks on cabinets and hazardous liquids are placed up high. Um, these are all things that we do as caring parents um, for our kids. 
So I can remember plenty of times um, that the things my parents told me um, not to do were unheeded, um, and I got hurt, consequently. Um, so in these chapters of Matthew 24 and 25, uh, Jesus is giving us lots of warnings um, about one thing in particular, and that is about his sudden coming back after a long absence. Now, uh, you might think to yourself, why is that something that we need to be warned about? Well, we will see. Um, so we don't like to hear about danger. We like to think that everything is fine. Um, we want it to be fine, but it is not. Um, there are very real dangers, and Jesus warns us about them in these, these passages. So when you watch a, a TV series, there are usually recaps at the beginning of the, 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 the TV series episodes. And because most modern TV series are continuations of what happened in the past. So there's this recap. So you might wish that you could press the skip button on me right now, but I don't have a, uh, there's no remote control for me. So here comes the recap. So Jesus is in the last week of his life. Um, we've said this many times. It, so it should, be, um, it should be a time that the whole nation welcomed their Messiah um, as their reigning king, but Jesus rather got a pretty sorry um, inauguration or welcome when he rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. Uh, most of the people were asking, well, who is this? Um, and the religious rulers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the legal scribes knew who it was, and we're not too happy that he was coming to town. So the reason is because Jesus was wildly popular with the people that heard him. They could tell that he was different, and thus he was a threat to the, uh, the control and the status quo that the Pharisees and others had set up. So Jesus also knew that he would be soon be tried and convicted. He kept telling this to his disciples. Uh, that he would be tried and convicted and crucified. And it was according to God's eternal plan that each thing was now beginning to fall into place. Um, he had just a little bit more time on the earth. And so he fielded questions from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, uh, but he also had a few questions for them as well. And we talked about those in previous weeks. And so he had some harsh words for them, because they were leading people astray with their teaching. And they, they should have been leading people to Jesus, but instead they were leading people away from Jesus. So Jesus, at the end of chapter 23, was grieved over the hardness of the hearts of the, of the leaders in particular, toward him their rightful king and their creator. And so in Matthew 23, 37, it says these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So now the nation was under judgment because they had rejected their Messiah. And Jesus told his disciples these words in Matthew 24, which we talked about last week, still part of the recap. Jesus left the temple and was going away. And when his disciples came to him to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, he said, you see all these, don't you? You see all these magnificent buildings? But he answered them, you, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon the other that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying or asking these questions, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And so the chapters that follow this are Jesus answering those two questions. Um, they thought they were the same thing. They, they thought they were just another nuance of the same thing. When, 
They thought that when Jerusalem is destroyed, surely that must be when he's coming back. But Jesus actually shows that those are two separate things. Um, if you read these, these texts carefully. So Jesus spends the next two chapters of verses answering those two questions. So there are specific prophecies here in these chapters that are related to the fall of Jerusalem. And that happened in AD 70. So Jesus' intent was to warn his disciples and the larger group of disciples, um, and through them many others, that when they see these signs to avoid going to Jerusalem, because that's what people did. The people in the country would come into the, into the city with, with great walls, and they would be safe from the invading armies. And so the walls of Jerusalem were 150 feet high and incredibly thick. And so they thought they would be safe there. So he, he, he told them, when you see these things happening, don't go to Jerusalem, but flee and go to the mountains. So all this happened in AD 70. The Romans attacked the city and killed over one million Jews. Um, and they thought that they would be safe in the city. So it was exactly in a way like the Lord of the Rings movie where the invading orcs have these great catapults and they were throwing huge stones into the city. That's what the Romans did to the city of Jerusalem in order to, to uh, destroy it. It took them a number of months, six months, but they eventually broke through. So Jesus uh, warned his followers of these events and told them to stay away. So those that listened to Jesus uh, were saved because they'd stayed away from Jerusalem. Those that heeded Jesus' words were saved from disaster. And so we see in Matthew 24, 15 and 16, he said this. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and he said, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, the book of Luke says it a little bit differently, but it makes it clear that this, these prophecies that Jesus was saying are about the fall of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, 20, it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. So, of course, this happened when the Romans came. They surrounded the, uh, the city. But Jesus is, in these chapters, is also answering both questions. Um, and we're not going to spend time, again, parsing the prophecies that, like we did last week if he was speaking of the past events or the future events. But now Jesus clearly turns to show them about his future return. And he concludes his remarks about the fall of, of Jerusalem as follows in Matthew 24. It says, From the fig tree learn its lessons. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things happening, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So he said clearly, you know, you know that summer is near in verse 36. But in verse 36, he says this way, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the father only, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the sons of man. So just to emphasize it again, first Jesus says, you know. Then he says about the coming of the son of man, that no one knows. So he's saying, he was saying to his disciples, save your physical life by not going to Jerusalem um, when you see the signs. But concerning the coming of the Son of Man, save your eternal life and be ready because there are no signs. So Jesus throughout several stories is beginning to give us some warnings to be ready. So we need to be ready for the end 
whether that comes, that end comes by means of our own death and, and going to, uh, to meet the Lord or the coming of Christ while we are still alive. Um, we need either way. We need to be ready because there will be no time to get ready. His appearing will be so sudden. And so that's what Jesus is warning us about. So if we look at chapters 24 and 25 together, we see that the, the greatest amount of verses in this passage um, is about being ready. There are about 30 verses that talk about the fall of Jerusalem, a few verses that talk about his coming in the clouds of glory, and 62 verses that talk about being ready. And so we can see that Jesus is most concerned about us being ready than us knowing the future. So in several places, the Bible calls us to examine ourselves and see if we are in the faith. Um, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So that's one way we, we test ourselves, whether we are in the faith. Is Jesus inside of me? Have I asked him in? Have I surrendered my life to him? Because the Bible says that when we open the door to him, he will come in. So that's one, it's one test of our faith. Romans 8 and 9, or Romans 8, uh, verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh. What he's saying is you're not merely human anymore. You're not in the flesh, but in your, you are in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So that's another test. Is Jesus within us? If we've asked him in, we know that he is in us. So these parables of Jesus are meant to cause us to examine the reality and the genuineness of our faith. So let's look at verse 38 of chapter 24. Jesus says, For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So in Second Peter, uh, he, in speaking about Noah, he says that Noah was a herald of righteousness. Um, he's a herald. It means he's speaking about God's righteousness, that um, he was a preacher to the people. And so when Noah was not swinging a hammer, um, he was out preaching the gospel of repentance and God's forgiveness to the people. But it seems like they were not listening. Um, they were unconcerned with the warnings, and the Bible says they were swept away in the flood. And so there are, there are people, um, these are people that are not ready because they, had, they did not have faith in God. Um, in our day, people say, I don't need God. I don't need church. I don't need Jesus. That's just a crutch. Um, so this week, there was a, uh, if you heard about it in the news, there was a 72-car pileup um, in the state of Illinois because of blowing dust. Uh, visibility, I guess, was reduced to, uh, to zero, and uh, 72 cars piled up, and unfortunately, seven people were killed. And so one moment, they're just driving through the countryside, and the next moment, they're dead. And so Jesus says, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, suddenly and unexpectedly. Verse, four, verse 40, then two men will be out in the field, and one will be taken, and one left. Two women will be grinding up the mill, and one will be taken, and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. So when we hear, hear these verses, normally we think about the rapture. And uh, so what is, what is the rapture? 
Um, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians that when Jesus appears, that we will be caught up together with him in the air. Um, and this is what we call the rapture. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so this is a thrill or rapture for us, uh, but for those that are left behind, it means judgment is coming. So Larry Norman, um, one of my, well, probably my, my favorite Christian singer or artist, um, wrote this song about this. Um, the song is called, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And uh, these are the lyrics. I'll try not to sing it. <laughs> so life was killed. Uh, life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died. The days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. And so whether these uh, Bible verses should be interpreted as the rapture is happening or as a person being taken away to judgment, like the people in Noah's day um, were taken away or swept away, it's not entirely clear. But either way, the point is the same. Once the sun has come, there's no time to get ready. You have to be ready. And so let's listen to, uh, to verse 43. And there's another sudden event. So Jesus continues with these stories. He says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. And so Jesus, of course, is not a thief, but the Bible says he will come like a thief. Um, nobody expects the thief to come to their house, but he does sometimes. Suddenly, he will come, he will come suddenly and no warning. So we're told not to be complacent. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. So last week, um, last week, last week, Vic had a close friend and fellow worker that who died suddenly, and um, fortunately, he was a believer. And, and was ready, as far as anyone could tell. But it was shocking. Suddenly, he was gone. And so to be ready, first of all, uh, we need to be sure that we have personally repented and put our faith in Jesus. That's the first step. To be saved from God's wrath, we need to flee to God. To be saved from God, we need to flee to God. Romans 10 says this, For there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God's invitation is for everyone, but we need to call upon the name of the Lord. And he says, we, when we do that, we will be saved. So there are, there are four more types of people to look at um, in verse 45. It says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. 
Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. So this is the first person that we've looked at so far that is a shown in a positive light. Um, and so how is this person full of faith is the question. First of all, um, this servant is imagining his master the whole time that he's gone. So his imagination is active. He thinks to himself, I need to be doing as my master commanded me that, so that when he returns, he will be pleased. And so faith allows us to see what our eyes cannot see. Um, in a sense, faith is our imagination used to picture God's will for us, and then we set about doing that. And so we pray um, in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, it's, it's up to each one of us to imagine and to listen to the Lord, what is your will? And what do you want me to do about it? So in Hebrews 11, the author, the writer of Hebrews spoke about the, the nature of what faith is. And he said this, he said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We are convicted about things that we cannot see, about who God is, about what his will is for us, and what we're supposed to be doing. And it says in verse 6 of the same chapter, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. That is our mode of operation, of operating and working in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So God rewards us um, when we seek after him. So we need to be able to picture what God wants in our lives and then by faith, we are to work to see God accomplish those things that he has put into our minds. And so God is pleased uh, by that when we operate that way. God is pleased by that. And we need, and that should please us too. We should be pleased that God is pleased. So, but now in verse 48, there's another person that does not have faith. Another servant in the same household. Um, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour that he does not know and will cut him to pieces, maybe by his words, and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the wicked servant, instead of imagining himself investing his life in doing the master's will, uh, says, he won't know. I can, in, I can beat and intimidate my fellow servants um, and to get them to do what I want, um, maybe to do my work or carouse with me and so on. But as before, Jesus says he will come uh, to him or... The servant will die and meet Jesus um, at an hour that he does not expect. So in this case, uh, he was cast into outer darkness, into hell. So Jesus continues his warnings, but this story is a little harder to figure out. Chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, 
for you know neither the day nor the hour. And so the virgins or the young women uh, were, were young women that were not married yet, um, and they were attendants of the bride at the wedding. And so um, they were to be shown the way to the groom's house uh, by the groom himself. And so these virgins had, had not made the basic preparation to, uh, to make sure that they could go. Uh, they were careless, and they did not even make the smallest preparation, apparently. And so it would be as if they did not bring batteries for their flashlight, or perhaps more directly, if they did not get on the bus when it came. So what are, who do these represent? Who do these virgins, or five virgins in particular, represent? So James Boyce uh, shares the following list of similarities between the, uh, the five virgins um, and the one that were careless and the ones that were wise. He said, first of all, they had all been invited to the marriage feast and they knew it. Okay, secondly, they'd responded positively and were coming. Um, they would say that they were Christians. Um, they came to church. Um, they had some affection and love for the groom, that's Jesus. Um, they confessed Jesus as their Lord. These virgins called out to Lord, Lord. Um, they all believed that they were prepared for his coming, um, and they all slept. But when they awoke, only five of them were actually ready. And so... Uh, James Boyce concludes um, that there will always be people in the church that have heard the gospel invitation and have responded in some sense and may even have some affection for Jesus, but who are not born again. And so this wedding is, of course, the wedding of Jesus himself to his bride, uh, the church at the end of times in heaven. Um, and so the book of Revelation speaks about this, this wedding that will take place in Revelation 19. It says this, Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the saints are all believers. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we see that the occasion that Christ has in mind is his own marriage to his bride, the church, and all who are part of it. So let's uh, take a minute now and step back and look at all this together. So I think that um, sometimes the greatest ability that we as humans have is not actually a good one, um, and it's the ability to be self-deceived. Um, and I'm not trying to be cynical, um, but I just see that in myself. One of the most difficult things to do is to see myself accurately and honestly. Um, and I've said this before, um, at other times when we've heard some very sharp words from Jesus, that Jesus never spoke more sharply to people than the hardness of their heart required. Um, so sometimes he does speak very severely, as in these stories. These are warnings to us to listen. So sometimes he's, he spoke very severely, but it's not just the crusty Pharisee that has the hard heart. Um, it's me and it's you. So we need Jesus' incisive words uh, to cut through our hard hearts. And so conversely to that idea that Jesus is severe as he needs to be, converse to that is also to know that Jesus is always as gentle as he can be. He's always as gentle as he can be. So he wants to take us in. He wants to bring comfort and salvation to us. He called out to Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. And so we've seen some different sorts of people in these parables. Um, like in Noah's time, there were 
there were people that did not know God. They didn't have much use for God um, or knowing him, and so they didn't know him. And uh, we've also seen some people that knew the master. There was a good one and a bad one. They knew the master. Uh, the good one did what the master, he, what he knew the master wanted, even though the master was gone. Um, the bad one did whatever he wanted because the master was gone. So finally, we've seen that some knew the master and loved the master in some sense, or the, the groom, but failed finally to be able to complete the journey. And so they were not ready, and the bus departed, so to speak. So all these are warnings that, that center on this idea that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. So we need to have a real and genuine and an operative faith. Uh, we need to be going about doing the master's will and preparing ourselves uh, to keep doing it by not getting lazy or distracted or seeking after our own pleasures. Earlier I said that there were some people, uh, maybe even in this church, that, that don't know what it means to be born again. Uh, they may be growing in their love for Jesus, but they need him to change them from the inside out. And so what do I mean by being born again? I mean that when a person puts their faith in Jesus, that God works, God works a permanent change in their heart and their nature, and they are born of God's Spirit, and the Holy Spirit lives within them. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3. He is a very learned leader of the Jews, and Jesus told him, things that he had never heard before. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And in a few verses down from there is perhaps some of the most famous verses of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so Jesus speaks to what it is to be born again. It's when we believe. It's when we believe that God has given us eternal life through his son Jesus and we believe and accept that for ourselves. That's when God does a, a work in our hearts. We are, the Bible says we are born again. We are regenerated. We are new people. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, the Bible says. So Charles Spurgeon wrote these words um, that I'll read in, in conclusion. He said, a, a great change has to be wrought in you far beyond any power of yours to accomplish ere you can go with Christ to the marriage. You must, first of all, be renewed in your nature or you will not be ready. You must be washed from your sins or you will not be ready. You must be justified in Christ's righteousness and you must put on his wedding dress or you will not be ready. You must be reconciled to God or, and you must be made like unto God or you will not be ready. Or to come to the parable before us, he says, you must have a lamp, and that lamp must be fed with heavenly oil, and it must continue to burn brightly, or else you will not be ready. No child of darkness can go to that place of light. You must be brought out of nature's darkness into God's marvelous light, or you will not be ready to go with Christ to the marriage and be forever with him. So I would like everyone to pray with me now, and I am going to pray for us um, as the different types of people that are portrayed in these stories. There may be some of us that represent the different types of people in this, and I would like to lead you in prayer. So let's uh, close your eyes and bow and, and pray with me. First of all, Lord, I pray for those that, 
that need to put their faith in you, perhaps the first time, to reach out to you and say, Lord, save me. I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. Jesus, forgive me. And I believe that your death on the cross offers me forgiveness. Thank you for dying for me. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I want to be born again of your spirit. Lord, I pray for those that are believers and may be getting lazy or pursuing their own way because you're gone. Father, don't let us do that. Lord, by your grace, give us the zeal to continue to follow you day by day, even though it seems like an ordinary day. Father, also I pray for those that are serving you. Lord, keep us ready. Keep us ready. Renew our strength, Lord. Make us strong to continue every single day asking you what your will is and helping us to, to push forward and accomplish it. Lord, we ask for your grace for all of us, Lord, to long and to hope for your coming, even though we, we don't know when that will be. Lord, creating us a desire to long and to hope for your coming. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my sure the price it has been paid for 
Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus, now and ever is my need. Oh, the chains are released. I can see. So a couple of quick announcements, actually more than a couple today. It's kept on adding on a little bit uh, here and there. There are a couple of things that have uh, our usual community groups that may be on break for some time. So one of them is Hiding His Word. That's going to be on break until probably the uh, start of the fall. As well as Pursuit Night is on break uh, right now. They will be merging with the upcoming summer study that will be going through the Ligonier conference materials, the sessions that occurred. That will be starting on Wednesday, June 14th, here at Pursuit, starting at 6.30 in the evening, okay? So that's coming up. Uh, just keep that in mind, kind of pencil that in, save the date. But morning Bible study is still on, going through the book of Proverbs on Thursday mornings over Zoom, led by Stephen. And then The Chosen, season three, episode eight, Season finale, actually going to be for both groups this week, but we're first. <laughs> so uh, Vic's group will be meeting on Tuesday night, and Emmy's group will be meeting on Friday night and wrapping up uh, season three. And then we'll be on a little bit of a hiatus for The Chosen. There may be a Spanish group that might meet sometime in the fall. We're in the early stages of considering that, of going through it again, uh, but in Spanish. All right. Now, let's see. Next week, Mother's Day, breakfast, breakfast, <laughs> breakfast, a very good breakfast, starting at 9.30, uh, so about an hour before service starts. If you'd like to bring something, please do. If you've got any questions, please see Mariana. She's coordinating that, so we'll have a Mother's Day breakfast. Uh, it is for everyone. It is not just for the mothers. While we are celebrating moms, it is for everyone, so it's not like the guys can't get in line or something. All right, so that's uh, for Mother's Day. Um, we do have today our first changeover from last Sunday prayer to first Sunday prayer. So today is first Sunday. So a couple minutes after we wrap up, uh, you know, uh, have some time of fellowship, we'll start our prayer time uh, today. Another save the date for what will be happening in the summer, July 10th through the 13th we will be having a summer VBS. It'll be in the afternoons here at the church. We do need some volunteers. And if you're interested in helping out, please see Emmy, and he'll be more than glad to get you connected on what we need 
for that summer VBS, July 10th through the 13th. All right, I think that's everything that I had. Oh, no, there's something else. Oh, yes, there is something else. Can you please put the prayer announcement? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, so prayer uh, worship service will be on May 13th. Why does that look weird? May 13th, uh, is that right? That's a Saturday. Yeah, that's a Saturday. May 13th, that's okay. That's good. It's just the 13th. That's the 13th that's throwing me off is on the date. But May 13th, starting at 10.30, 10 a.m. here at church. Yes. Okay. 10 to 11 here at the church uh, next Saturday, uh, the 13th. All right. Is that it? Luke 22, verse 42. Luke 22, verse 42. Did I say that right? Yes. I did. Okay. Thank you. Please stand for the benediction. Benediction is God's blessing for us for the week ahead. In Titus chapter 2, it says these words, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearance of of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Go and be blessed. And hang around here a few minutes for us to pray. I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come true, because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies. All my fears and doubts, they can all come true. 